only mode. Hello, good morning to those joining us from the United States, Canada, and parts of Latin America, and good afternoon or good evening to those joining us from Europe, Africa, and Asia. My name is Laia Greeno, and I'm coordinator for NGO Effectiveness at Interaction, where I manage our evaluation and program effectiveness working group. Interaction is the largest coalition of U.S.-based international NGOs with nearly 200 member um, organizations, large and small, faith-based and secular, focused on a single issue or many, working in one country or in every region of the world. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you today to um, our second webinar uh, with two of our members, Oxfam and Save the Children, who will be presenting on their approach to and experiences with impact evaluation. Um, as I said, this is the second in a series of webinars on impact evaluation that Interaction is developing with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation and which are meant to accompany a four-part impact evaluation guidance note series. Um, in our first webinar, which took place last week, Patricia Rogers gave an overview of the first guidance note in the series, which is an introduction to impact evaluation. Um, this second webinar is meant to highlight how organizations are addressing some of the issues identified in the guidance note in practice. Um, so I'd really like to thank our presenters today for volunteering for this task. And they are <coughs> Allison Davis, Research and Evaluation Advisor at Oxfam America, Mulu Chekel, Senior Director for Monitoring and Evaluation at Save the Children, and Larry Dershem, Senior Design Monitoring and Evaluation Advisor for the Middle East and Eurasia, also with Save the Children. So in, in case people were not able to join us for last week's webinar with Patricia, I'll begin the session today with a quick overview of the series, and then we'll be turning it over to Allison, Mulu, and Larry for their presentations. Um, we'll save questions until the very end of the presentations, and you'll notice that we've added just a little bit more time to allow the full 20 minutes for Q&A, um, after which I'll wrap up with a brief word on next steps. So as I said, I don't want to take up too much time, um, so I'm, I'm going to give uh, this overview of the series fairly quickly. Um, the purpose of this guidance note series is to increase organizations' understanding of and ability to conduct high-quality impact evaluation. Uh, the four notes in the series are Introduction to Impact Evaluation by Patricia Rogers, Linking Monitoring and Evaluation to Impact Evaluation by Bert Perrin, Introduction to Mixed Methods for Impact Evaluation by Michael Bamberger, and Use of Impact Evaluation Results by David Bonbright, who's Chief Executive of Keystone Accountability. Um, the series is targeted at NGO staff in particular um, and has therefore been developed with extensive input from interaction members, but the series um, will be applicable to others as well. Uh, the notes are about 20 to 30 pages in length and so are meant to just be an introductory resource on these topics um, to raise the issues that organizations should be thinking about when conducting impact evaluation and to highlight additional resources where possible. Um, each note will be translated into Spanish, French, and Arabic and will be accompanied by one or two webinars like the one we had today. Um, so the notes along with the recordings of the and presentations from the webinars will be posted on Interaction's website as they're developed. Uh, the first guidance note as well as the materials from the first webinar with Patricia is already available on Interaction's website at the link you see before you at the bottom of your screen. And those from today's webinar will be posted by tomorrow, if not later today. So just a couple of notes on the technology before I turn it over to Allison. Um, if you would like to minimize or, or maximize this screen that you're seeing in front of you, um, you could just click on the orange arrow. If you'd like to view the presentation in full screen mode, you can click on the blue box before that. Um, we, we won't be using the, the raise the hand feature um, because there's so many people joining, but, um, and, and you'll remain on mute for the rest of the webinar. Uh, but if you do have a question, please type it in the question box, um, noting if the question is directed at one of the speakers in particular. Um, I'll be monitoring questions throughout the presentation, so please don't feel you have to wait until the very end to submit them. Um, and 
Allison, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, you're ready to go. Okay, thank you very much. It is an honor to be invited and to give everyone a bit of a window onto our experiences of impact evaluation at Oxfam. My presentation is going to focus on some key design challenges that we face at Oxfam. We're in a global development field that is increasingly working through networks and coalitions. And at Oxfam, we have programming that is specifically designed to be complex. We have long-term programs involving many actors at different levels and many types of activities all coordinated towards the same goal. And it forces us to think a lot about managing learning and evaluation needs at this level of complexity. So how to approach, for example, questions of attribution and con contribution of the results we are seeing in our work. First, a, a little background. Oxfam has many lines of work. The largest volume of our work is in humanitarian response and preparedness, and there are unique impact evaluation challenges in this field. Next in volume is our long-term programs, which are the subject of this talk. We also do a large amount of work in U.S. and global advocacy and campaigning, and our evaluation staff here are really doing some great work here um, and linking um, advocacy and campaign evaluation to long-term impacts. And finally, we have innovation projects, which are models that are held fairly constant and tend to scale horizontally. Um, some of these type of projects are more amenable to certain designs like randomized control trial or quasi-experimental design. And for example, we're currently in the final phase of a mixed method randomized control trial on savings-led credit groups in Mali. But for the purposes of this presentation, we want to highlight our long-term development programs and some of the unique challenges in evaluation here. These long-term programs are often described in relation to a rights-based approach in development. One tenant is that deep, lasting change in structures and ways of working is slow to achieve and requires persistent efforts. So these programs make a long-term commitment of at least 10 years working in coalition with others towards a common goal for a specific population. It involves multiple types of work at mul operating at multiple scales, local, national, sometimes international. Advocacy is always a part of this work in some form of, or another. And all of our programs have a central concern that people at the center of our work are driving the change. So that is the landscape on which we are designing an impact evaluation. And for these programs, there are two main elements of evaluating impact. First is, is about people coming together and reflecting on their impact. We call this internal annual impact reflection. It involves stakeholders and people from the communities where we work, and they discuss impact trends. They might bring a variety of, to, uh, a variety of data to the table from a variety of sources, such as external impact project evaluations, um, participatory monitoring data. Um, these deliberations surface multiple debated perspectives on changes happening and what actions to take. And the second is external impact evaluation, which we conduct every three years. The audience here includes internal stakeholders, but also, but also management and even executive leadership, the board, and the public. This is periodic, methodologically driven um, perspectives on change and its significance. Both, let me go back, sorry. Both of these processes are critical anchors for our monitoring and evaluation learning systems, and to some degree they are mutually reinforcing. So, for example, doing annual reflection helps to create the impetus for better internal monitoring data, and better data helps the quality of the external evaluation. Um, these internal reflection processes on impact also provide an important plant platform for which we can discuss the impact, the three-year impact evaluation, so that makes it more likely to be used and useful to people. So I want to focus now on external impact evaluation and to use an example of one of our programs to illustrate some points about design and complexity. 
So we have a program in El Salvador to prevent gender-based violence, and it works in seven counties or municipalities in El Salvador, as well as has major national level campaigns aimed at policy change, raising popular awareness, getting gender in schools. It has six core partners, and in addition to the work they do in their specific geographies, they work collectively on all sorts of things, on this ag advocacy and campaigning with with national targets, the Ministry of Education, and so on. A key process in the program design that sets up later evaluation is this collective construction of a theory of change. We believe theory of change at this level is really important. It surfaces shared assumptions across the coalition about how change will happen and how their particular work could play a part. Um, in, the, in the case of El Salvador, the group includes all of the women's organizations and NGOs that Oxfam's partners with, but also other stakeholders and experts on the topic, as well as women leaders representing the various communities where we work. From an evaluative perspective, we want to test the assumptions behind this theory, but also to understand what the coalition means by impact at different points in time. So getting at this question of how the coalition defines impact, what we see is an intersection of major outcome domains that collectively are contributing to impact. They operate at different levels, local, national, and regional, and across time. This blue circle groups desired changes in policy, codes, norms, things that you might call the opportunity structure. This orange, groups, orange circle groups desired changes in social practice. So it's not just the existence of a law, for example, but the quality of its enforcement, as well as the way people are talking about and acting on the issue of gender violence in, in, in public and personal spheres. And finally, well-being and agency. So these changes speak to the conditions of people's lives, so women experiencing less gender violence, but also people's ownership of the change and how they drive this change. This slide could apply to how we are seeing many indicators group across all of our programs, and that impact is the intersection of the three. One domain needs to be assessed in relationship to the other two. So improving the conditions of people's lives may not be enough if people themselves don't own the change and take it forward. Um, and all of the, their efforts can only get so far if the structures of power are stacked against them, but you can have helpful policies and codes, but they won't be helpful if people don't actually change behavior, if no one upholds the law. So what's key here, and this relates to complexity theory, is that you can't, you can collect all the data you want in any one domain, but it's the way you make sense of all of it that matters. It's making the connections and being able to see how power operates through these connections. So coming back to our example. The coalition came up with 10 common impact indicators across these domains, and we had the task of evaluating them in a way that could bring out this inner, their inner relationship. The green dots here are all the municipalities where the coalition has a presence, and we came up with three main research pathways. The first involved information across all the municipalities that we could get from document review and available statistics. So for example, gender-based violence is a portion of overall crime as, as just one example of these kind of indicators. A second path was to do comparative case studies that really looked in depth at the dynamics of impact. So the red stars here are where we did case studies. Um, we studied indicators like the actual prevention actions by municipal governments, whether women were perceiving differences or were more confident that gender-based violence is being addressed. The third pathway was specifically to look at the coalition's influence on decision makers and policy at local and national levels. Um, so here we use specific techniques in advocacy evaluation, and one researcher was completely devoted to this. These are indicators such as the national policies, the quality of the national policy changes that were advocated by the campaign, um, whether there were better mechanisms for civil society to influence prevention policy, for example. Then we had to synthesize and analyze across these pathways to say something about our progress against our theory. 
So in this example and others, we have learned a, a few common lessons about tackling complexity in, in program level impact evaluation. In terms of process, we use multidisciplinary teams because the complexity requires multiple approaches. We try to coordinate through a regionally based research institution, and this is because we put a high premium on context specific competencies, and also because we want the research experience and findings to contribute locally. When you are working in complex coalitions, the evaluations are part of a collaboration, so there is con consultation around design um, as, as part of the research methodologies and as well as in sharing and validating findings. Methodologically speaking, we have found that comparative case study design really works well at this level of complexity. It's good for looking at the interlinkages across variables, how power dynamics play out through in-depth examples, and how, all of, and how these examples put to test the theory of what we thought might happen. At this level, we also uh, do a lot of stakeholder document synthesis. Um, we collect available statistics. We don't try to repeat surveys where they've already been done. Household survey can be part of the case study design, and we've tried this as well. Um, finally, we always have to look at the effectiveness of our advocacy and campaigning, and, and in the best case, we actually conduct an, an advocacy evaluation using best practice. So with respect to attributing change observed to the work of the coalition, we find that this is more feasible at the outcome level, so the component project evaluations or a specific campaign effort. At the program level, we are analyzing our contribution to change and confronting our assumptions about how we thought things might play out. So some methods we might use to investigate our contribution is looking at how our project level evaluations are able to link effects observed to different activities and then synthesize across. Um, another is in how we select the case studies. Do we include an example of an area where we have no local presence? Um, and where we do quantitative methods within case, we can look at difference between areas or peoples with more or less exposure to the coalition activities. And finally, we need to go back to our theory of change and trace how we actually had influence in relationship to how we thought we might have influence on different objectives and see what this says about how we organized our work and how we perceived our role in relationship to others. So these are all methods that relate to impact evaluation in complex contexts, and they really emphasize the kind of analysis needed to look across a por portfolio of work. Biggest challenges? We could go back to the same case study every year to look at, you know, we do go back to the case studies every three years to look at longitudinal change. And could this somehow drive program emphasis, knowing that these cases get such attention? Um, when coalition-wide evaluation processes really depend on good data, do these big three three-year research processes come at the expense of spending monitoring and evaluation dollars and time on doing good evaluation of the component pieces. There's high staff cost in time and resources in finding and coordinating, helping to coordinate interdisciplinary teams. And it's difficult to find experts with credibility both within the coalition and to outside readers of the evaluation. So finally, what has Oxfam learned about evaluating in, in complex coalitions for social change? Um, the, the process is highly collaborative. You make decisions about the evaluation in consultation with others, and you involve them in deliberating about findings. This makes things more complex, but it also increases the use value of the, of the evaluation. Second, at this level, it, it's about testing a social change theory, it's not about establishing causality. Um, next, in-depth comparative case studies are very good for studying things like power dynamics and how variables, variables come together. Looking at our contribution to the way events rolled out is very important 
So we may have had success and failures at different moments of, of time, and we need our researchers to think carefully about how to examine our contribution across many different efforts. Finally, there's a strong emphasis at the level of synthesizing data across projects and from available sources. We think all of this fits well with Patricia's guidance note, and perhaps it highlights some additional points about impact evaluation at the level of complex program coalitions. So thank you very much. And I will try to pass the screen over. Hi, uh, sorry, I was uh, muted. Um, thank you, sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Laya, can you confirm that you can hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending the session, and uh, it is a pleasure for us to share our experiences. Um, our presentation will be divided into two sections. Mula, uh, sorry, the first part, I Mula? would like to take a few minutes to Mula, Sorry, we're not yes. seeing your screen. There we go. Now it's, now it's back on. It's back on? Mm hmm Thank you. All right. Okay. No, uh, not, here, I'm, so I will, um, I'll just bring it, it back up on now? now. Yes, it is. Okay, right, yeah. Okay, um, in the first part, uh, part, I would like to take a few minutes uh, to discuss uh, Save the Children's Overall Approach to Impact Evaluation, why impact evaluation is important and how it fits within the context of our theory of change. Um, and also quickly go over the factors we consider before we decide on conducting impact evaluation. Um, in the second part, my colleague Larry will uh, give a couple of uh, practical examples uh, from uh, the mid-list. Um, so, how does Save the Children define impact and impact evaluation? Um, as you can see, um, up here on the screen, Save the Children has adopted the OECD definition of impact, which is not uh, new to many of you. Uh, but in an emergency setting where we would be in, in uh, many occasions, we, when we talk about impacts, the effects uh, may be assessed um, in terms of outcomes. For example, uh, during an emergency response, um, a real-time evaluation on the impact of our response uh, tend to focus on utilization of services, uh, whether it is children who have been vaccinated against measles or children provided with supplementary food or drinking water, as opposed to measuring high-level impact. Uh, such as reduction in malnutrition status or averted diseases, etc. Um, um, in the same tone, our definition of impact evaluation is also similar to the definition that is proposed in the guidance note. Uh, for those of you who have um, had the chance to review the guidance note, you may have noticed the similarity here. Uh, 
but I want to highlight uh, in this definition one phrase, which is attribution to an intervention. Um, in, in Save the Children, our intent for our intervention is to implement the key elements of our theory of change, which I will come to in the next slide, uh, in order for us to achieve impact at scale. Uh, so attribution to the intervention in this case has uh, a broader definition of attribution to the key elements of the theory of change that may not all be implemented directly by Save the Children, uh, but those interventions that Save the Children had a, a catalytic role. Uh, whether it is to improve health status or learning outcome of children, we see uh, the theory of change contributing to these um, um, in, in collaboration with others who are involved in, in contributing to these. So as such, uh, it is a loose definition of attribution, more closer to contribution. When we look at attribution, though, we will be looking at just one element of the theory of change. Uh, for example, in the, in the area of innovation, we'd look at whether or not that innovation brings about the change we want uh, to see. Uh, and, and we can determine attribution at that level, but the overall impact is, is uh, determined by looking at overall change that comes uh, as a result of our theory of change. So what is Save the Children's Theory of Change? Um, um, a theory of change, as you know, is a description of how an intervention is supposed to deliver the results, the intended results that we want to achieve for children. Uh, what you see in this schema is that um, uh, that this part of the theory of change um, it depicts um, includes innovative approaches that save the children produce creates innovative approaches uh, to improve children's uh, situation uh, whether it is at a national level or community level um, uh, the area in terms of us being the voice for children depicts our advocacy and campaign work for better practices and policies using evidence. Um, the third element of our work uh, that supports implementation at scale looks at um, whether or not the, the interventions that we are implementing are being implemented at scale in the quality and standard that we want them to be implemented. Um, we, in the middle, you will see partnership. Um, why it is in the middle? Because we use partnerships to carry out all, all the other three elements. For example, in the area of health, we partner with research institutions and the academia to develop innovative solutions and generate evidence. Uh, we work with grassroots, grassroots supporters and civil society organizations to advocate for policy change and we partner with national and local governments to scale up our intervention. Um, uh, for example, our work with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education um, um, falls um, in all, either achieving results at scale or working with us in terms of uh, some innovative solutions that are uh, uh, that are appropriate for the context that we, we work in. So what does impact evaluation play in our theory of change? Um, uh, it will help us to determine whether a, a given innovative approach works and how it works. Um, a, for policy interventions, for example, it will help us to taste whether our, our advocacy is making a difference, uh, are policies put in place, are they being implemented, etc. But what factors do we consider before we determine an impact evaluation? Um, the first factor that we see is that why do we need to conduct impact evaluation? What element of our theory of change are we evaluating? Um, is, is this um, embedded, is impact evaluation embedded in the program design? Or will, will it, this require us to modify the project design? Um, we look at these questions before we, we start, we, uh, decide on an impact evaluation because it entails a lot of uh, processes in order for us to make the adjustments necessary to uh, conduct the impact evaluation. Um, the second element we look at is what type of impact evaluation design is proposed? Why, how do we determine the rigor in the, proposal, in the, the proposed design? Uh, I think there are varied beliefs in how rigor is defined, as uh, most of us know, um, including uh, whether an impact evaluation 
uh, to qualify to be rigorous uh, is, is that it should be a strict experimental design. Uh, while we believe the need to conduct experimental design for certain situations, for example, to evaluate untested innovations, uh, we believe that we we ha there are other robust enough methods that can deliver the same credible evidence that Larry is going to look at um, in a minute. Well, what we say is that all methods should, should meet the level of rigor that's required to answer the, evalu the evaluation questions. Another area of uh, uh, consideration uh, is uh, cost effectiveness, uh, which is also closely tied with resource availability. Is the evaluation design cost effective? Uh, we, that means assessing value for money, which, is, which has been highlighted uh, during Patricia's presentation um, um, last week. Uh, which impact evaluation should be appropriate for project, the project type um, and, and the context we work in? Um, does the context we work in limit us, uh, the, limit the impact evaluation designs available to us? For example, in an emergency context, applying a control group uh, is not uh, feasible, um, uh, is not feasible, so we, we will be choosing the appropriate method to conduct the impact the appropriate impact evaluation. Um, another factor we look at is who will conduct impact evaluation. Um, while objectivity is a key factor in making the results credible, we also believe the role of program staff impact in impact evaluation is important. Our evaluation standard, uh, we do have an agency evaluation standard which recommends uh, not necessarily just purely for impact evaluation, for any type of evaluation, at which recommends that at least an external team leader should be involved to maintain objectivity, um, um, but um, we also uh, emphasize the need to um, involve project staff in evaluations so that there is uh, a knowledge, enough knowledge um, it in inputted into the uh, impact evaluation design um, of the um, in the next slide, um, Larry is going to give us an example from uh, the Middle East. Um, Larry, are you ready to move on? I am going to hand it over to you. I will advance the slide. Yes, I'm ready. I'll say hello to everyone from uh, Tbilisi, Georgia. I think there's uh, the warning. There'll probably be quite a, a shift here, in that the two previous presentations are at let's the more organization agency level and a longer term program level. What uh, I'll be talking is almost uh, a, a, let's say a magnifying glass, looking at uh, two particular projects. So really uh, focusing in on uh, really what would be some three to five year projects, more short term. So, uh, of course, it's very difficult to give a lot of details in a, a few minutes about any project, and I'm going to have to be quite quick on this, so I'm sure there will be a lot of details I leave out, but hopefully I'll hit the uh, highlights. So the first project I want to uh, mention, the location, is in Palestine, West Bank. Uh, and the goal of this project was, the overall goal was improve livelihoods of youth in Palestine. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with Palestine, many of the challenges, and you'll know there are many uh, challenges for Palestinians, but one of the large ones for young people is really a very high unemployment rate. Uh, you know, recently, in the last three to four years, uh, the situation has been improving, but youth unemployment still remains high. And, but a growing sector actually is what we usually call blue-collar jobs, and, such as constructions, electricians, electronics, uh, computer networking, mobile phone repair are increasingly uh, becoming high demand there. Uh, however, culturally, for most Palestinian youth, uh, academics tend to be the, the main uh, avenue for, um, for education. And uh, this has to do also with uh, lower cultural status of those who graduate from vocational technical education and the higher status of those who go on to academic studies. So in 2006 and 2007, uh, Save the Children was awarded uh, a grant from USAID to help improve vocational technical education in the West Bank uh, of Gaza. And the project heavily was involved with uh, improving facilities, handicap accessibility, equipment, supplies, teacher training and qualification, modernizing the curricula, youth outreach, 
uh, and even providing scholarships. Uh, but as uh, several years went by, we just noticed that the enrollment uh, and interest remained relatively low. So we instituted a small little uh, study to look into some of the possible reasons. And one of the reasons uh, that became very prominent was actually the parental attitudes. Is that still, uh, in Palestine, even though it's modernizing quickly, there's still parents have uh, a major say in the educational um, choices that their, that their children make. So we soon realized that, in a sense, at our meso level, our theory of change was that we should, uh, parents were left out. And it became very important to actually get uh, positive attitudes of parents toward vocational education. Uh, so what we uh, designed was we thought we need to understand how to actually start to work with parents and, and, and influence um, some of their attitudes. So really the basic research question, uh, could we design and was the set of activities or awareness campaigns, could we actually increase the positive attitude of parents toward vocational tech for the children compared to parents who were not involved in these activities? So that was our basic research question. Now going quite a distance away over to Central Asia, to Kazakhstan, uh, this is a project uh, which is a conditional cash transfer, also known as a CCT, and this started in uh, 2009. Uh, right now, Save the Children is implementing this with the World Bank and with IREX. And uh, the goal of this project fits with the general World Bank um, uh, goal with conditional cash transfer, and that's improved human capital. Uh, the basic approach is to provide very poor families uh, a monthly cash transfer, and that cash transfer is conditional. That's if certain conditions are met. Now there's several types of poor families that are targeted uh, and there are different conditionalities, but I'm only going to refer to two in this. And the first conditionality is that very poor families with children four to six years of age, the children must attend preschool or ECD centers. Uh, the second type of families are those with pregnant mothers and the conditionality is mothers must uh, regularly attend health clinics for antenatal screenings. Now, for this project, uh, the evaluation question was, and is, does the transfer of cash to very poor families and households actually increase attendance of pregnant mothers uh, to help clinics for antenatal screens, and does it increase children's attending preschool or early childhood development centers? Uh, these, in a way, represent what Patricia Roger refers to as the intermediate outcomes, not the, the longer term, just the intermediate. So in summary, the, the two impact evaluations increase parental attitudes toward VOTEC and attendance of, of four to, um, and then also attendance of children and pregnant mothers. So that's the basic questions we're after. Um, why is impact evaluation used here? Uh, there is a, was a large interest and still is a, a major interest of the Ministry of Education in Palestine to scale up the Save the Children's vocational uh, interventions throughout the entire West Bank, over 15 different vocational technical uh, institutions. Uh, however, we knew that parental attitudes were a crucial element for youth enrollment. So we wanted to actually study what could influence uh, parental um, attitudes. Uh, there were also additional organizations working in the West Bank uh, in vocational technical education, having mass media that could also influence parental attitudes. And also we wanted to do an impact evaluation because we, we were going to have to spend some extra funds that weren't originally planned for in the budget and we wanted to be accountable to, to the donor who was uh, USAID. Uh, now as for Kazakhstan, most of those same reasons apply. And it's what uh, Patricia referred to as, you know, upward accountabilities. Uh, so in CCT we also wanted to be accountable particularly for uh, the funds that were being used in the conditional cash transfer. Um, now, for many of you who are familiar with conditional cash transfers, they've been uh, studied quite heavily with impact evaluations and have generally been shown uh, quite positive on uh, short-term uh, impacts such as attendance. Uh, what was different uh, about this is that almost all CCP programs have occurred in, uh, this is uh, Latin America and other countries, none have actually occurred in a post-Soviet state. So it was, uh, very much interest to see what type of uh, impact CCT had in post-Soviet uh, countries. Um, there's one other, but I think at the time I'm not going to cover it too much, was that there was an interest in uh, cost effectiveness. And as Patricia mentioned in her talk, which is relevant, is that 
you know, cost effectiveness actually has to have two elements. Uh, the first element is what are the actual input costs for a program? And then the second element, what's the actual outcome that's been achieved? So that you get the cost effectiveness is the amount of inputs for what type of effect. So we wanted to be sure that uh, this study also included that. Now, uh, which designs were used? Uh, you know, we wanted, because we were talking about attribution, we needed to come up with uh, and construct some type of counterfactual, which in the short just you know, what means what outcome would have occurred without the intervention. And the, in Palestine, due to time and budget, uh, we went with a less rigorous uh, quasi-experimental in which we found match groups. And the match group was uh, getting uh, from 11 different vocational technical institutions uh, parents of students uh, from the different schools. It wasn't actually a random selection. Uh, it was based on some other criteria. And then a group of parents who also had students in those same institutions but were not involved uh, very much in their children's education. So we took the two groups and the one group, our intervention, uh, we actually used um, attitudinal scale called Attitudes Toward Vocational Education that were developed by Ahmed Al Said from uh, Jordan. And we used it as a baseline for both groups of parents and then an inline uh, with both groups. And this was after about five months of intensive activities with uh, a group, uh, intervention parents on having them visit the schools, having them visit employers, having them review the curricula. So intensive working with the parents to, in a sense, influence you know, more positive attitude for vocational education for, for their children. Now in Kazakhstan, it's a, it's a mixed method approach. It's uh, experimental design in which we do have random assignments. Uh, there was approximately 80 villages were selected in which uh, 40 were randomly selected to receive conditional cash transfer and 40 villages would not. Uh, there's a quantitative baseline and inline that's going uh, the baseline's already been conducted, the end line has not occurred yet. Um, and it will be looking at particularly pre-enrollment of four to six year olds in school and the attendance of pregnant mothers in antenatal health screenings. Uh, there are also two qualitative studies involved in, in this in which the, we will be looking at both um, the, the quality of the interventions Again, as Patricia mentioned, that we don't want to replicate, uh, we want to make sure that when we replicate, we know what we're doing. So we have a qualitative study making sure the interventions are done according to plan, and that uh, the second qualitative study actually looks at any type of unintended uh, impacts that might be occurring. Who was involved? In Palestine, uh, because of, again, time and budget, this was primarily the vocational technical institutions, the Save the Children staff, and myself. Uh, we helped with the questionnaire, we uh, did a, found the match groups, we did the data collection, the data entry, and um, I was involved with some of the data analysis on that. Uh, we would have liked to have had uh, some external assistance, but um, just as Allison mentioned, you know, trying to have regional partners who uh, are research institutes that can help. Uh, those are fairly scarce in Palestine and even some of the Middle East, uh, which is one of the difficulties we've been having there. But also due to time and uh, uh, cost limitations, we, we went ahead and just uh, did it ourselves. Uh, in the CCT project in Kazakhstan, this is um, actually was a tender put out uh, and it was um, uh, actually selected for I think 15, no, I'm sorry, about 12 different organizations applied and Oxford Policy Manage, Management actually won the tender, so we'll be conducting and uh, overseeing the impact evaluation. But that entire process from the tender to selection and even part of the negotiation took over five to six months just to, to get that uh, done. But Save the Children has been involved from the beginning uh, with the World Bank uh, in negotiating with, with uh, Oxford Policy Management all the way to the design, the uh, implementation of the impact evaluation. We've been uh, quite involved in reviewing all study reports and being able to give our viewpoint and also to discuss some of the findings with uh, some of the beneficiaries and the households. So we've been able to contribute to those reports. 
Now, what were the costs in Palestine? Uh, that matched group quasi design. We really fit within our 5% uh, budget, which Save the Children usually puts within each project's uh, already allocated for Remedy. So we it didn't cost that much. So it was within the allocated budget. Now, in Kazakhstan, due to the, the, the design there, which is quite rigorous, it's, the cost is approximately uh, $1 million. Now, a recent World Bank report on impact evaluation says that the average rigorous impact evaluation like this goes anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. So this this one tends to be a little bit more expensive, but that's because we have included uh, quite a few other different uh, qualitative studies with that. Um, what were the main challenges in Palestine? The biggest uh, challenges was because it's a match group and it's two points in time, the baseline inline, it actually represents a, a panel data set. So we need to make sure that the person that, or the parent at time one, is we actually go back to that same parent in time two, and that that actually matches up, those questionnaires match up in the database. So that took some, uh, it took several rounds to make sure that that was uh, done correctly. But then actually also when we started doing the data analysis, interpreting the results can be quite challenging uh, because this was used a difference in difference approach. So we took uh, the difference between the intervention parents between time two and one, and then the, the difference between time two and one for the control, and then that double difference, what was the difference between those two changes. So that can be kind of challenging uh, overall to do that type of interpretation, but it, as a group effort it turned out to be you know, uh, quite interesting and also a capacity building uh, uh, activity. Um, for CCT uh, in Kazakhstan, it's, uh, the major challenge has been uh, with the project is rollout and implementation has been very much uh, at the uh, almost the control of the impact evaluation because, you know, the villages were randomized and so you have control and intervention and the rollout, we, you know, we have to stay away from the control villages because of what are called contamination effect and other issues like this. So uh, trying to implement a project and yet you can still keep the design was, was quite challenging. Uh, the results that we achieved, um, overall, you know, there was 27 different attitudes that we assessed on that uh, standardized tool. And the biggest difference actually from all those intensive activities over the five to six months with the parents was that uh, we're using the difference in difference approach is that the parents who were involved in those activities actually showed a large increase in the attitude that that they did see that vocational education for the youth do provide better employment opportunities than if their children had gone to university. So that was actually many of the other attitudes and you can well under know and many of you have experienced is attitudes are sometimes difficult to change and so even Five months is a short period of time, but there were some that we were able to see, and now scaling up, uh, this will be one of the campaigns or the issues that the Ministry of Education say will be uh, targeting for parents is uh, highlighting more about the employment opportunities uh, for their students, or for their children. Now, as for the CCT in Kazakhstan, uh, the, the end line won't occur until later this year, so there are, uh, aren't any quantitative findings. However, there have been some very interesting initial qualitative uh, study on the outcomes uh, in which so far from the qualitative studies, it, uh, we, we seem as if the impact is going to be there in that there is a large increase in attendance to uh, preschools and uh, a much higher increase of pregnant uh, mothers to clinics. Uh, so one other interesting finding was from a qualitative that was unintended is that actually in many of these villages is that the children and the mothers that are involved in this have actually increased uh, what the Oxford Policy Management would call a social integration. That those who were formerly marginalized now with this with their children being able to attend school and mothers attending clinics actually now reintegrated them in a sense into their villages which was an unintended um, uh, outcome originally from this. Uh, project. Um, I'm going to skip the last one on uh, cost effectiveness. We'll go to the last slide. Is that yeah? So how are the results used? So the Ministry of Education, I already mentioned, is going to be scaling up uh, the curriculum, and particularly is very much interested in not only 
uh, intervention activities with students, but also their parents. They're both going to be heavily involved in the design, uh, promotion, awareness campaigns. The CCT in Kazakhstan, uh, the results that are going to be used there is that uh, Save the Children has uh, quite an interest in working with the World Bank on rolling out conditional cash, tr cash transfers in post-Soviet contexts and other places in the region, maybe not as large as, as Kazakhstan, but we still have an interest. So we're very much interested in the, how the mechanism works and what type of outcomes it can produce. And the World Bank is extremely interested in these because to date all conditional cash transfer programs are, uh, are, are government run. This is the only uh, conditional cash transfer actually impl implemented by a non-government uh, or, or an NGO. So there's a lot of questions on uh, the type of mechanism used, the interventions, but also the outcomes. So uh, my apologies for going relatively quick there, but uh, I'll close here and I'll look forward to any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, Larry and Allison and Mulu for your presentations. Um, I'm just going to jump straight into the questions um, so that we have a, as much time as possible for that. Um, Allison, the first couple of questions are for you. Um, the first question is, how long did the theory of change exercise take with the coalition and do you have any tips for keeping the exercise manageable? And then the second question is, whether in your mixed methods design, it, was there a randomized component? And if so, can you talk about that a bit more, especially in terms of the challenges of randomizing interventions using a rights-based approach? Thank you, everyone. Um, those are very interesting questions. For the development of, of, of theory of change in these coalitions, the timing um, varies depending on uh, people's experience with it, the facilitator's experience. Um, for the particular example uh, in El Salvador, um, I was not actually involved in the original development of the theory of change, so, but I know that it, it, it does take uh, a series of times, and this particular coalition had the habit of meeting often, um, and so they developed it over a series of, of, of discussions and were able to put it together. I, I've been involved in one in, in uh, West Africa that took, uh, um, it, it was part of the development of program strategy. It's kind of part and parcel and it took, um, you know, four big sessions divided a month apart with all of these coalition people to develop um, their program th theory of change and strategy. Um, so the second question, in mixed methods design, in certain case studies, we, we could do a, a, a highly quantitative design um, at, the, at the program level if, if we so desire, but we tend to do that at the project level, so it's up to us to have component projects that might um, be experimenting with different types of evaluation. Um, and really, as a, um, Larry pointed out, it's very expensive, so we are always trying to balance program level evaluation resources with component project levels, but where we have key things that we really think test our theory of change, then it's worth the investment perhaps to do um, more expensive types of, of, of evaluations. But as I said at the very beginning of the presentation, the um, where we're more likely to do randomized control trials are not with these long-term coalition programs, but with our innovation projects. These are, these are things that, um, where the intervention is held fairly constant, so the model does not change a lot over time. Um, we, I, ho I hope that answers the questions a little bit. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Allison. Um, then moving on, this, this third question is, could actually be for both, um, both presenters. Oops, sorry. Um, so this question is from Dale Hill, um, who's interested in hearing more about the use of impact evaluation for cost effectiveness, um, which Save the Children mentioned. Has Oxfam used it for this purpose? And would there be limits to, to general generalizability? Um, would you have enough quantitative information on the valuation of outcomes to, to project um, to other contexts? 
So I'll just let you, um, if, if either of you have points to address on that specific question before I move on to the next one. Larry, why don't you start with that one? Okay. Um, well, I'll go back to what I was referring to in that, in, yeah, cost effectiveness. And I think Patricia mentioned it in her presentation too, is that um, if I could give two extreme examples of what I mean by cost, or usually meant by cost effectiveness. If a program uh, has a lot of cost, it's a high input cost, but the outcomes are very low, the, or the impact is, that really wouldn't be a program where you'd want to scale up because the costs are too high for the, 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 actually your return. Uh, the other extreme would be if you have a project in which the input costs are low, but the outcomes and the impact is quite high. That would be a, a project or a program that you'd want to scale up because you have you know, very little in, investment and a very good return. Again, those are the extremes. So the cost-effective analysis that we used with the CCP program in Kazakhstan is in the World Bank's interest was they're actually going to be comparing uh, the cost-effectiveness of a CCP program run by a non-governmental non organization compared to governments. And so for the World Bank, they wanted to add the cost-effectiveness study, so which involved very, very uh, exact records of all costs, uh, where they went, so that we could track that. Then once the impact evaluation is done, th there are quite a few other CCP programs that have had similar studies, and they want to be able to compare uh, you know, the, the return on investment in a sense, so a very economic type of, of, of analysis. Allison, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I'll just jump in and say, sure, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, I can, I'll just jump in and say we have um, some interesting things going on in disaster risk reduction in which you're trying to project um, cost benefit into the future for, um, for uh, reduced impacts of disasters. Um, this, these are all very um, new and, and interesting methodologies. I, I think we need to, at our, in our long-term rights-based programs, we need to think about cost effectiveness more, but the, the type, when I'm talking about looking across a program at cost of effectiveness, it's very difficult to um, compare across highly different strategies. So, for example, uh, looking across an, a campaign advocacy effort that's linked to very specific uh, project level interventions in a community um, and, and, and considering both of these as part of the same program, it's hard to, to make these kind of calculations, but it's an area where we definitely need more, more, more work. Thank you. Um, Mulu, the next question is to you and actually kind of touches on what will be the, the theme of the second guidance note, which is on linking monitoring and evaluation to impact evaluation. And the question is, how do you incorporate impact evaluation into your broader evaluation context? So, valuability assessment, process evaluation, outcome evaluation, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. This is a very um, important question um, because we have been uh, Save the Children actually worked, um, and then when I refer to Save the Children, this is uh, about the global movement. Well, Save the Children is also a network organization um, that worked uh, that works um, to bring about change uh, globally. Um, as we were looking at um, evaluation uh, as one activity that we need to focus on. We worked on defining our evaluation standards and uh, by evaluation we looked at the different types of evaluation and impact evaluation is one type of evaluation that we'd like to focus when there are uh, questions that cannot be answered by any other types of evaluation. So, um, uh, so basically in terms of incorporating impact how we incorporate uh, impact evaluation in our broader evaluation context is that impact evaluation is one type of evaluation um, that we will conduct for uh, assessing the impact of our intervention as was described earlier and, and uh, articulated in our theory of change. Um, so um, uh, 
it, it is one of one the type of evaluation that happens not uh, frequently uh, because we also um, think uh, believe that uh, other levels of evaluation the process evaluation and outcome evaluation can answer uh, the questions that we, we will have in terms of you know processes and implementation effectiveness etc but um, but are, are limited to the um, type of questions uh, that we want to answer. And then as Alison uh, mentioned, uh, one area that we focus impact evaluation on is when we have innovative approaches that need to be uh, tested, uh, at, that means proof of concept, and, and then we look at a specific element of implementing at scale, specifically when we look at the quality of implementation at scale uh, with our partners. Thanks, Mu. And I am just going to put up um, one more question um, on the screen, because, or, or actually a couple of quick questions. The first is, um, were there any negative um, unintended outcomes in both Kazakhstan and Palestine? Um, so, Larry, that question would go to you. And then I think um, something that a lot of, of organizations are interested in, and this is for both presenters, um, from Su Xuan Fu. Um, how do you keep the organization engaged in impact evaluations, given the cost and length of time it takes to conduct rigorous evaluations? Um, so, so if you could both, um, so Larry, the first question to you, and then to both Allison and, and Wulu, the, the last question. As for uh, negative unintended uh, consequences, I would probably focus more on the, the Kazakhstan and the CCT. Um, I, and I don't know that I'm going to say that it is completely uh, unexpected uh, type of consequences that uh, because villages are randomized um, and Kazakhstan being a, a, a large country and put it in context, Kazakhstan as a country is, is I think, equal or larger than all of Europe. So it's, it's, it's a huge country. And uh, you, to, to do randomization across that large country is not possible. So the randomization of village selection had to be within a relatively close uh, geographic area. And these uh, villages, of course, here and know what's going on. And one of the negative unintended was that there were uh, community, let's say, they, problems with certain communities because others were getting conditional cash transfer, other families, other households were benefiting and they weren't. So um, there has had to be some um, you know, discussions with uh, local, or called uh, in the Soviet states, oblasts, which is the equivalent of a state in the U.S., so with local state leaders, district leaders on uh, this design. So it, it, did, it did create some difficulty there, which has influence some of the project and implementation. Um, I can, I can uh, take a stab at the, the second one, and Alison, you will fill in, uh, in that. I think one of the key things I would like to promote with our senior leadership in, uh, in the organization is that uh, demonstrating impact is to support our accountability. And, and that accountability is not just to donors, uh, but also to the public and the children that we serve. So how, what helps us to demonstrate that impact, whether it is impact, uh, how do we generate evidence for impact is, is uh, um, that we are actually delivering impact for children is, is why we go into impact evaluations. Um, we understand that it is costly, but, but we also understand that um, impact evaluation should, rigorous impact evaluation should not equip um, experimental design. Uh, we believe that there are um, there are cost effective uh, uh, design cost effective designs that could be des um, that could be rigorous enough to answer the questions. Um, so we try we tend to be selective in terms of which design ca should be. Um, um, should be applied, and then I think the key question there for our in, to engage our leadership uh, in our organization is that um, it is about accountability. Allison, is there anything you would like to add? Yeah, from our perspective, uh, Oxfam itself has uh, 
there are not a lot of issues around keeping Oxfam interested in impact evaluation. There are more, there are more um, aspects around keeping our partner NGOs um, engaged and interested in, the, in, in an evaluative process. And the way to keep them involved, especially because they can be long, um, is to involve them in from the very outset in understanding and helping to define the impact questions to be answered. Um, and a lot of these partners come directly, are grassroots, they come directly from communities. So um, getting their interest is sort of part and parcel with getting the interest of the people who are going to be involved in the study. Um, and then not just extracting information and then presenting it upwards, it's really about when you do research, the findings um, people need to benefit themselves from the findings, so we have all sorts of ways of presenting findings back to communities and involving them in understanding a research, which makes them much more likely to be involved in a research process in the future because they themselves also um, benefit from discussing the findings. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so that is all the time we have for questions. Um, and thanks very much to, to Alice and Larry and Mulu for sharing your experiences. Um, before closing, I just wanted to mention again that the recording and presentations from this webinar will shortly be available on Interaction's website at www.interaction.org slash impact dash evaluation dash notes, um, where you can also find the materials from the previous webinar. Um, and for those of you who submitted questions during the first webinar, the answers to those questions will be posted on the website next week. Um, in terms of next steps, if you have questions for the panelists that we didn't get to address today, here is their contact information, and I'll also be sending this out in a follow-up email. Um, we'd also love to get your feedback on the webinar, um, so you'll also get a link to a short survey after this, and we appreciate it if you could take a few moments to complete that. And then finally, uh, just wanted to let you know that the next guidance note in the series linking monitoring and evaluation to impact evaluation will be released next month. So please watch for that and for information on the accompanying webinars. And with that, thank you everyone to, for your participation and thanks for sticking with us a little longer than anticipated. Thanks very much.